Hello, everyone, and welcome to Relationships Lesson 8, the breakdown of romantic relationships, which is explained by Duck's phase model. Okay, just as a little bit of an introduction, um, many people kind of view relationship breakdown as a one-off event that just kind of happens when a person or a partner decides to leave a relationship. However, Stephen Duck, a social psychologist, suggests that relationship breakup is a process that consists of several distinctive stages that people pass through um, before the relationship is actually well and truly over. And it is these stages that make up Duck's phase model. Okay, so we're now going to go through those stages and have a look at what each of them entails. Okay, so according to the theory, there are four stages of breakdown that people go through. Okay, so the first stage is called the intrapsychic stage. So in this stage, it's when a person admits to himself or herself that they're dissatisfied with their relationship. And they spend a lot of time thinking about the reasons for why that might be, um, reasons why they're dissatisfied, and also possible ways forward from that point on. The stage focuses very much on a person's internal thought process that occurs before they actually feel like they can confront their partner. After that they reach what's known as the dyadic stage. Okay, so the dyadic stage it is when a person feels able to confront their partner and voice their dissatisfaction with the relationship. So at this stage, there's a lot of complaints that come from the partner that initiates the breakup. Um, common complaints involve a partner's commitment to the relationship, for example. Um, the dissatisfied partner also starts to rethink the alternatives that he or she might have to their current relationship. After the dyadic stage, they move into the social stage of breakup. So at, at this point, the couple who usually have kept their disagreements private, I say usually here because sometimes that's not the case, but if at this point they've managed to keep their disagreements private, in this stage they start to involve friends and relatives and start to make their problems um, and their breakup more public. That's why it's called the social stage. So according to Duck, at this point, once the conflict reaches this stage, it's far more difficult for a couple to actually repair their relationship. So friends and family start to take sides. They start to intervene in the couple's relationship. They start to offer advice, um, which makes re reconciliation much more problematic. Um, although there are certain times when friends and family will try to offer help in order to repair the relationship, more often than not, they start to butt in and offer advice, um, which can cause more problems than it solves very often. And then the final stage is what's known as the graves dressing stage. Okay, so this is the point where having left their partner, both the sides start to construct their version of why the relationship broke down. So more often than not, that involves minimizing their own faults and maximizing their partners, but at the same time trying to show themselves as trustworthy and loyal in order to be able to attract a new partner in the future. So it's all about making yourself look really good and making your partner look less good and making it all their fault that the relationship broke down. So it's called the grave dressing stage because it signifies the closure of the previous relationship and it kind of signifies the readiness to start a new one. Now each of the stages has a specific threshold that people cross. So in the first stage, in the intrapsychic stage, the, the threshold that they have to reach is this idea of I can't stand it anymore. Whereas when they're in the dyadic stage, they get to the point where they start to think, well, actually, you know what? I would be justified in removing myself from this relationship. I actually have a justifiable grievance that I need to start to talk about and I need to get out into the open. When they reach the, the social stage, it's more of that um, 
real life, I mean it, I'm done now kind of threshold. Um, and when they get to the grave dressing stage, the threshold is this thought of it's time to start a new life. So I'm putting what happened behind me and I'm I'm ready to start moving forwards. So those are those are the four stages of relationship breakdown according to Duck. Okay, so it's a it's a very short outline. That is really all you need to know about Duck's phase model and how people go through a relationship breakup. Um, the theory isn't perfect. There are a few things that are that are wrong with it, and it's been modified several times since it was first published, but that's something that we will go through in the evaluation section of this video. Okay, so for now, that is all you need to know about the outline of Duck's phase model. Okay, I'll put some slides up on the board here so that you can take some notes if you need to. That is stage one and two, and this is stage three and four. Okay, so pause the video at any point to take notes that you might need to take. Okay, and now I'm going to move on to the evaluation bits. Okay, so the first thing to say is that Duck's phase model actually has some really good real world applications that are used on a fairly regular basis. Um, not only does the model help us to identify and understand the stages of relationship breakdown, but it also suggests various ways of reversing it, which can be highly beneficial in relationship counseling. So the model is especially useful because it recognizes that different repair strategies are more effective at particular points in the relationship breakdown. For example, Duck recommends that people in the intrapsychic phase could be encouraged to focus their brooding on the positive aspects of their partner rather than only focusing on the negative aspects. Also, as a feature of the dyadic phase is communication, any attempt to improve this and perhaps improve wider social skills could be beneficial in fostering greater stability in the relationship. Neither of these strategies is likely to be of much use in later phases of the breakdown, but in those particular stages, those two strategies can be very, very useful. And so they're used very regularly in relationship counseling to help couples get closer together. So it shows that Duck's model of relationship breakdown can be used successfully to help couples contemplating breakup to improve their relationships and to stay together. So in that sense, it has very good real-world applications. However, a limitation is that it has quite severe methodological issues. So most research examining relationship breakdown is based on retrospective data using questionnaires or interviews to ask participants about the breakup some time after it happened. So people's memories of the event may not be very accurate and may also be colored by their current situation, which means that their answers are not necessarily reliable. It's usually the very early stages of relationship breakdown that tend to be the most distorted or ignored altogether by research. And unfortunately, it's almost impossible to study the point at which problems first appear because researchers are very reluctant to study relationships at that early point in relationship breakdown because their involvement could make things worse or even hasten the end of the relationship that may otherwise have been rescued. So that means that part of Duck's phase model is based on research that ignores the early parts of the processes. And so it can be an incomplete description of how relationships actually end. Moving on, as I said earlier, Duck's phase model has also been criticized for being an incomplete model. So according to Rolly and Duck in 2006, the original model of breakdown is oversimplified. So they modified the model and added a fifth phase, which is known as the resurrection phase. The resurrection phase is where the ex-partners turn their attention to future relationships and they use the experiences that they gained from their recently ended one to make better choices in the future and to create a better relationship in the future. Furthermore, Rolly and Duck also make it clear that progression through the stages is not inevitable and it's possible to return to earlier stages at any point um, rather than assuming that 
people have to kind of move from stage one to stage two and from stage two to stage three and from stage three to stage four, they actually reiterate it doesn't work that way. People could move from stage one to stage two to stage three, back to stage two, back to stage one, and so on and so on. So making these changes actually helps us to overcome the original weaknesses of the model, including the fact that the model doesn't account for the dynamic nature of breakups with all of their inherent uncertainty and complexity. But these changes that were made help to kind of overcome some of those problems. Okay, and a final evaluation point then is a culture bias. So remember, you can get these issues and debate points in here all the time. It's really nice to have these issues and debates points because actually when you do the issues and debates topic, you're more often than not asked to refer to topics that you have um that you've studied over your two years of psychology. And so you know having these topics to actually refer back to is good. So a problem with the model is that it's based on relationships from individualist cultures where ending the relationship is a voluntary choice and separation and divorce are easily obtainable and don't carry any kind of stigma. However, that may not be the case in all cultures, for example, in collectivist cultures, because in such cultures, relationships are sometimes arranged by wider family members and characterized by greater family involvement, which makes the relationship difficult to end. That means that the breakup process won't follow the phases that have been proposed by Duck. So as a result, Duck's model is culturally biased and it assumes that all breakup processes are universal, which is clearly not the case. Okay, so there is definitely a culture bias in this particular model. Okay, so you've got four evaluation points there. I hope they've all made sense. On the next four slides, I have the peeled paragraphs for each of those evaluation points. So I'll quickly flick through those now. Okay, so there's your useful real-life applications. There's your methodological issues, followed by an incomplete model. You've got some research support in there by Toshiro and Fraser in 2003. And then to finish it off, you've got your culture bias point there. Okay, so take any notes there that you wish to take. Go back through the video and make any notes that you want to, that you want to make. And that brings us to the end of the video. Okay, I hope it's all made sense. Hope the evaluation points are all clear. And I hope it's been useful. Thank you very much for listening.